Kalimera, thank you very much to Bunkernet for having me this morning. So, nine months to go before the world's kind of the most drastic shift to hit the shipping industry hits us. Um, it seems quite bizarre to be standing here nine months before with such a strong fuel oil market uh, at present, but really what's the most kind of the most clarity that is going to hit the market is from the second half of this year. That is when we'll start to see the change. IMO 2020 doesn't really begin on the 1st of January, it begins before that. Especially for the refiners and those big players, you'll start to see the changes in the shipping market from around the second half of this year. Now, what does Associate Editor mean at Platts? I basically do the daily fuel oil assessments, so high sulfur fuel oil, low sulfur fuel oil, and 0.5% fuel oil. So those numbers, whether you're happy or upset with them, you can complain to me. So I'm going to discuss uh, a different, a different pricing structures that we've seen for fuel oil and distillates over the last couple of uh, months and what the forward curves are showing. Secondly, I'm going to discuss how the European refining sector is gearing up for 2020. Now, the Mediterranean seems to be very, very prepared and in a good position, so it's a good place to be standing right now. And what products are set to gain from IMO? This seems to be a relatively obvious answer right now, but actually there's still a few things that seem quite unclear. And finally, what's Blatt's doing to prepare for, for IMO 2020 and the 0.5% sulfur cap? So first up, history lesson. This is the Northwest European benchmark for fuel oil, the 3.5% for Rotterdam barges. So a lot of people use this benchmark in order to price fuel in Northwest Europe. Now this is the cash differential to the month one paper structure. So if you look from January 15 to uh, January 2017, you can see the market's very weak. There's a contango structure in the market, and this is largely due to the heavy, heavy amounts of fuel oil in the market. Russia was pumping out a lot of fuel oil, and that was really depressing the premiums, keeping earnings low in the fuel oil market if you were active in the fuel oil market. But from January 2017, that's really when things began to change. So Russia hiked its export taxes on, on fuel oil to equal that of crude, and that incentivized the Russian refiners to upgrade their refineries. So that was taking out a large portion of fuel oil from the market. I say a large portion, Russia has too much fuel oil, it's still a lot of fuel oil. But they were essentially preparing to increase the production of distillates and gasoline. And that's when you began to see more seasonality in the fuel oil market. So you'd see bunker demand in the winter throughout, and in the summer throughout the year. And then in the summer months, you'd see that extra boost to the European fuel oil market from Saudi Arabia, the power generation thirst. So they were importing a lot of fuel oil in order to feed their oil-fired plants for air conditioning. Now, 20, 2018, I got told when I joined Platts, Platts, in the winter months, go on holiday, put your feet up on the desk, it's boring, it's quiet in the fuel oil market. 2018, I didn't want to leave my desk. There were so many things that I've been told that are counter-seasonal, that were unprecedented, and this is largely due to changing supply factors that weren't really in the picture when we first kind of the, for the IMO sulfur cap was first mandated. So take the Iranian sanctions, the US sanctions on Iran. So Singapore import around 1.2 to 1.4 million metric tons a month of Iranian straight run for the bunker market. Now from May onwards, that meant Singapore were waving their hands, Europe, please give us some fuel oil, we can't take the Iranian fuel oil anymore. So Europe was sending cargoes, extra cargoes to Singapore. On top of this, it was peak Saudi summer air conditioning demand. So Saudi Arabia were taking a lot of European fuel oil. And this, so you had the bunker demand in Europe, you had Saudi Arabian summer power, power generation demand, and you had the Iranian sanctions. All factors that the European market wasn't quite ready for. And then people thought, okay, winter, maybe supply will begin to improve, prices will begin to drop, availability will be better in the bunker market. Wrong. October 2018. The most anticipated event of the, of the Northwest European market hit the market. The Exxon Coca at Antwerp. Everyone was messaging me all through the year. Is the Coca online? When's the Coca coming online? Do you know anything? End of October, that's when that Coca finally came online. 200,000 metric tons a month of RNG grade fuel oil was taken out of the bunker market. And that's why we saw such a strong backwardation at this point in October. Um, last year in the Northwest European market. You had barges going from Antwerp to Rotterdam, Rotterdam to Antwerp in order to meet that shortfall that that coca was taking out of the market. January, US sanctions on Venezuela. Another, another heavy barrel out of the market, another loss for the heavy fuel oil market. But that's why that strength has, has stayed in the European fuel oil market. 
Now, if you look at the forward curve, let's focus on the pink line or red line um, at the beginning. So the backwardation is still here. The backwardation is still here in 2019 for the high sulfur fuel oil market, that pink line. We've got nine months to go. This product is going to be in little demand in 2020, but that strength remains into early 2020. Yes, of course, you would expect the demand to drop, so that backwardated structure is nat natural, but it's the strength of that structure. Why is that structure so strong? And so now we're coming into Saudi Arabian summer air conditioning demand. That European fuel oil is going to be sent. So we're going to see that backwardated structure stay. That means it's really difficult to store product in tank. But you are at a, di a dilemma. If you are a barge owner or a tank owner, when do you clean your tanks? You're suddenly making money from the high sulfur fuel oil market. You've been waiting to kind of make some premiums, for example. And now you're stuck with a dilemma. Do I move to 0.5? Do I move to MGO? Or do I stay with high sulfur until the last possible moment? So there's a lot of questions that remain in the market. If you take the blue line, that's the 1% fuel oil market. So the 1% fuel oil market is a small market. It's uh, the utility market. It's what's used to keep the lights on in Cyprus, for example. Um, it's around 800 kT of demand a month. Now, the reason that there's such a drastic spike is because 1% fuel oil is going to be an attractive blend stock to produce 0.5% compliant marine fuel. Now, at the moment, if you look at the beginning of that graph, the price spread between 1% fuel oil and 3.5% fuel oil is practically non-existent. Really, really cheap, cheap 1% fuel oil because high sulfur has been so strong. But as soon as we approach kind of that second half of this year and continue on into, the, uh, into 2020 and 2021, 1% fuel oil is going to have to compete with the marine market. That utility market is going to have to compete with the marine market. And the demand is really, really going to pick up for the fuel. Now let's look at the orange line, gas oil. Gas oil is the big kind of hurrah uh, product that everyone's looking towards. It's going to be the saviour of IMO 2020. It's going to be a, dis a distillate-based future. The gas oil structure is completely flat. It shows kind of no representation to what's happening in terms of IMO 2020. Now, naturally, you would expect, okay, towards the end of this year, we should sit, sink into a contango structure in order to incentivize storage. And then maybe from kind of February, March 2020, our analysts our analyst that plans forecast that we should see a backwardated structure as the demand for gas oil begins to pick up. But right now, that forward curve is really not reflecting what we're expecting to see happen in the market. So if you look at this on a flat price basis, uh, gas oil's become the blue line and high sulfur fuel oil is the pink line. Gas oil on a flat price basis in the coming months is far more expensive than high sulfur fuel oil. Now, we don't have a forward curve for 0.5%. Hopefully that will be coming soon, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of if you're looking at this on a flat price basis and you're a ship owner, you're thinking, gosh, I'm really going to have to cough up a lot more money um, in order to be able to keep my ship going in 2020. But over the last couple of weeks, I've been meeting a variety of um, ship owners, bunker suppliers, for instance, and they've said, initially, we're going to focus on MGO. MGO is a tried and tested product. People know what they're getting. Okay, yes, if you're a ship owner, your vessel probably isn't designed to run on MGO for a long period of time. You might need to buy some extra lubes, etc. But at the, initially, MGO is that kind of safe bet. We don't know what's going into those 0.5% blends. It would be lovely if the refiners came out and said to us exactly what is in those products, but the, there is still a lot of uh, lack of clarity in the market today. Hopefully, once we have the 0.5% curve, we can see a little bit um, more of a price incentive, but kind of Platts Analytics est estimate that the spread between high sulfur fuel oil and gas oil will be $320 a metric tonne in 2020. And just based on that poll earlier, that was quite interesting to see the spread. Um, the people I've been speaking to in the market think that $50 a metric tonne for VLSFO below MGO is too small. That, wide sp that spread is going to have to be uh, further apart in order to incentivize owners to use 0.5% fuel or VLSFO. So if we look at the forecast from, my, uh, from our analytics team, you can see that the spread between high sulfur fuel oil and low sulfur fuel oil is expected to widen drastically. So the pink line is the Northwest European benchmarks for 3.5% and 1% and the blue line is the US Gulf Coast benchmarks for 3% and 1%. Now that price spread widens drastically to around $200 a metric ton um, towards the middle of next year. But then it stabilizes. The calm, before, the calm and the storm has kind, of, have, has kind of terminated. I mean, the initial panic, yes, okay, we're gonna see that huge thirst and huge panic looking for the compliant fuels, but eventually the market will stabilize. 
So how's Europe prepared in the refining world uh, for IMO 2020? Now, as I mentioned earlier, Russia is the main con kind of controlling sector of the European structure of fuel oil. Russia is that main powerhouse. Now, with the falling exports that we saw from Russia, this has really contributed to the stronger structure in the European fuel oil market. 2015, we saw 55 million metric tons of, Euro of Russian fuel oil exported. That number fell to, 20, uh, to 30 million metric tons in 2018. Now, that's a stark difference, but it's nowhere quite close to zero. For example, take Rosneft. Rosneft are not going to finish their modernization program until 2025. That's still a lot of fuel oil that we're going to see in the market coming out from Russia. Yes, perhaps they could use it domestically if the price is attractive enough, but still, Russia's going to have a lot of fuel oil, and that's where we are going to see the price discounts for high sulfur come in. If high sulfur fuel oil is cheap enough, we're going to see the problem of sulfur be passed from the marine industry to the power generation industry. It's going to be attractive in power stations. So I've showed the slide at a couple of conferences before, but just in terms of um, Bay of, by way of update, looking at Rotterdam and Antwerp. Rotterdam is the world's second largest bunker hub. It is geared to produce high sulfur fuel oil. That market is focused on providing high sulfur fuel oil bunkers. So the Rotterdam market has really, really had to prepare for IMO 2020. It's had to scramble to ensure that there is going to be enough compliant fuel so they remain on top, on their top pedestal as a bunker hub. So you've got that Exxon Coker I mentioned earlier, the SDA at Antwerp, Shell's Pernis SDA, uh, sorry, Total's SDA, Shell's um, SDA. All of these new units are limiting the production of high sulfur fuel oil and increasing the production of more valuable products like the distillates, for example. But what's interesting in Rotterdam is that despite this backward data structure that we're seeing, the tanks are full. The contracts in the, for uh, tanks in Rotterdam and Antwerp, they've already been taken. Despite this backwardation, the market is willing to take on this expense in order to ensure that they have enough 0.5% fuel and storage for 0.5% fuel, whether to blend it or to have it as a finished product, in 2020. So they're willing to take on that expense. Tanks in Rotterdam, at various uh, tank owners, I can't say who sadly, but they've, they've begun to interconnect their tanks with different lines. So the, they've begun to connect the fuel oil tanks with, di with the distillate tanks in order to blend. And that, blending, that cleaning process has started today. For example, I was speaking to a barge owner the other day, and he said that he was cleaning his barge. He hasn't cleaned it for a long time. He said there was 50 to 60 centimetres of sludge at the bottom of his barge, and he had to physically get a pickaxe and actually kind of smash it all up, pick it up with his hands and dispose of it. You need to be prepared in order to clean your barges and your tanks well ahead of 2020, because it's not an easy process. It's not an overnight process. Now what's interesting as well about this chart is that you've got Gunvor and BP who have not upgraded. Now Gunvor initially they were going to upgrade, they were going to install a delayed coca like Exxon, but they came out and said no, due to changing economic conditions, we are not going to install this coca anymore. Now Gunvor and BP are going to be really attractive to those owners that have scrubbers. Rotterdam is still going to have high sulfur fuel oil, Rotterdam's going to have 0.5, Rotterdam's going to have MGO. These bunker hubs, as Uni said earlier, they will, all have, they will have the, the three fuels that you need, four fuels perhaps, if you're looking at a 0.5% residual blend and a 0.5% di distillate blend. But let's take the Mediterranean. Now, in the fuel oil market, typically the Mediterranean, the West Mediterranean, has relied on imports from the Black Sea and from Northwest Europe. The West Mediterranean has always kind of been balanced to short uh, high sulfur fuel oil in terms of the bunker market, because that's where the bunker demand lies. But what is so interesting about 2020 is that the West Mediterranean refiners are really, really confident that they are going to be able to supply 0.5% to their own market, to their own kind of demand centre, but also further afield. So this typical short that we've seen in the fuel oil market is no longer going to be there. Instead, we're going to see different flows. Are we going to see flows from the West Med, for example, to Latin America? Latin America has a lot of heavy sour crudes. Chile, are we going to see 0.5% fuels produced in Chile? Probably not. So are these fuels from the West Med going to be arbed, or for example from Houston down to um, other regions of the world? So it really is a refiner's game. A lot of ship owners, for example, they're confident they'd rather go to a refiner than a blender to take that 0.5% fuel because that refiner has produced it in his refinery, so he has straight run fuel and it's gone straight to his tank. There's no messing about with traders in between. Take Malta, for example. Malta is a blending hub. Now, Malta is a really, really popular port today. You don't have to pay the port dues. You can take large vessels, for example. But it's a blending hub. 
you're going to have a lot of different concoctions of 0.5% fuel. If you're visiting Malta, for example, in uh, early 2020, what fuel are you going to get compared to if you go to, say, Lisbon and visit Galp or Algeciras and visit Sepsa? Now, the fuels that the Mediterranean refiners have been producing are very close to the RMG spec that we know today, the ISO specification. They're 0.5% sulfur with a 370-380 CST viscosity. That's pretty good considering that you're focusing on sulfur. Now, again, we're, as Uni said, we're waiting for the ISO to release its next specification, the next indicator to the, to the market. So it's all very well that these refiners have been blending to 0.5% specifications based on today's knowledge, the RMG grade that we know today, the ISO 8217. But what happens when they release a new specification? What happens if there's a parameter for something random like calcium that they weren't expecting? They have to go back to the drawing board. So if you're a ship owner, if, you're, if, I'm, a Lenny, uh, if I'm a Lenny Vessels or whatever you want to call me, and I go to SEPSA today and I say, please can I test your 0.5% fuel? Say yes, I'm happy with SEPSA's product, all good, I sign my contract, and I go and take my first delivery in October this year. That product could be completely different in October because, say, SEPSA have take, had to take a different stream because of Cruise, firstly, but also because ISO may and hopefully have released their new specification. So it's a very, very difficult time. It's all very well saying a lot of ship owners will be looking at contracts in 2020, but there's this big kind of hole that we still need to fill as we get closer to 2020. So changing global refining capacity. On the whole, without even realizing, we've been, the refining sector has been gearing up for 2020 to provide the compliant fuels and also a more distillate uh, light end based future for a long time. If you look at the chart from 2010 to, 2010 to 2014, that secondary capacity, that complex refining capacity, has been increasing for a long period of time. And then you had the announcement, the official announcement in 2016, that the sulfur cap was happening. And the refining capacity, capacity did pick up, but that, that big change that we saw really happened between 2010 and 2014. So we have been essentially gearing up for this process for a while. So these are the existing fuel oil trade flows that we know today. So if you look at the heavy black lines, they are the flows from Russia and from Europe to Singapore, the world's largest bunk hub. You can see some flows to the Middle East. You can see some flows to Africa for um, power generation. Now, these flows, what's going to happen in 2020? As I mentioned earlier, the West Med seem to think that they're going to be balanced along 0.5. Are we going to see new arbitrages flowing from the West Med down to um, Latin America, if freight is, if freight is favourable, are Singapore still going to want high sulphur fuel oil in 2020 from Europe? That arbitrage for Singapore, for Singapore high sulphur fuel oil is going to close at some point. We're going to see that kind of profitable flow that has supported the European fuel oil market dwindle away. Now whilst we might see five cargoes of five BLCCs a month or so go to Singapore, the expectation is that come Q3 this year, those VLCC flows of high sulfur fuel oil are going to begin to slow down. And that's when we'll start to see the change in the fuel oil market. And will Singapore continue to import high sulfur fuel oil because they have a lot of distillate and are able to produce 0.5%? We don't know the answer, sadly. So if you look at the crack values, kind of early 2018 and before, that makes sense. That's what you learn at school, that's what you learn in a book, that's what you learn at university. From April kind of, or July 2018 onwards, that makes no sense. That, why is that happening? What on earth is going on? Why is fuel oil pricing at the same or similar values to gasoline? The reason that NAFTA isn't on here is because that's a cargo crack and I'm reflecting barge cracks. But fuel oil was pricing above NAFTA. Now the reason is because we've had such a diverse kind of change in the crude slates. You've had the sanctions, as I mentioned earlier, on two heavy barrels, the Venezuelan barrel and the Iranian sanctions. Uh, and the Iranian sanctions, despite some waivers in the market, that has supported the European fuel oil crack. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Asian arbitrage will close eventually and the fuel oil crack will soften. But there's no reason why that fuel oil crack won't stay strong for the next couple of months, because you've got that Saudi thirst for fuel oil, that Saudi summer air conditioning demand, which will prop up that demand. And we're not quite at 2020 yet. Gasoline, gasoline is expected to recover. I'm just gonna jump slides. So this is the forecast from our analytics team. Over the next couple of months, gasoline is expected to recover. You have the change to the summer specification. Um, you've got refinery maintenance, for example, um, and US driving season. But also what's interesting about the gasoline market is that gasoline, obviously you take VGO and you run it through your FCC to produce gasoline. 
VGO is an attractive blend stock for the 0.5% for, uh, for the 0.5 percent pool. Now, VGO is in plenty of supply. Those tanks are full right now. But get, as we get closer to 2020, those low sulfur VGOs that are pretty nice to produce a nice 0.5% residual blend, they might be taken away from the gasoline pool and that might lift some support to the gasoline market. But our analysts um, forecast that high sulfur fuel oil cracks will drop to minus $25 a barrel in 2020 and diesel will become positive $25 a barrel in 2020. Now, who knows what Trump is going to tweet tomorrow, but based on the everything being stable and the, there's no more sanctions, for example, imposed, that's the picture that we're expecting to see at Platts. So what products are set to gain from IMO? So naturally, you can see that the increase, there's going to be increased production of lighter products. So we've got a lot of new refining capacity coming online. You've got the Jazam refinery, you've got the um, three refineries in Asia, you've got the refinery in Malaysia. I can't pronounce any of these, that's why I'm not naming, naming them, but I'm happy to speak to you afterwards about them if you would like. Um, so that's increasing the yield of those lighter, more valuable products. Middle distillates, that's going to be a thirst. There's going to be a thirst for middle distillates for the marine pool. And also, the vacuum residue pool is going to be dwindling. Now, I sit on the fuel oil desk. Am I still going to have a job in the middle of next year? I don't know. Maybe I'll be joining the distillates team. But hopefully, I'll still have a job. So let's take the demand. So today, 3.6 million barrels a day of high sulfur fuel oil bunker demand. Now, the first 600,000 barrels a day is going to go to scrubbers and non-compliance. I think the estimates are very similar. The IEA says around 700,000 barrels a day. So the numbers are pretty similar that are floating around there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about scrubbers afterwards. But that leaves 3 million barrels a day of high sulfur fuel oil bunkers that need to find a home. So the first 2 million barrels a day are going to come from gas oil. Gas oil blends. Gas oil blends for 0.5. So we need to find that gas oil in the market. Asia seems to be pretty good in terms of distillates. The US, they have seemed to be pretty set for their refining capacity. Europe, the Mediterranean, which was a kind of initial concern, seems to be ready for 0.5% in terms of uh, their blends. Northwest Europe, it still seems to be a little bit of an answer. But they're ready. the refiners are ready, they've upgraded. But in terms of actually seeing those products, we still have yet to see those products in the market. Now the remaining 1 million uh, barrels a day, so the first 2 million is coming from gas oil, 0.5% blends. The remaining 1 million barrels a day are going to come from 1% blends. So those 1%, that 1% fuel oil with low sulfur straight run, low sulfur VGO, for example. Now, Whilst it's all very well saying that I've tested a nice 1% 0.5% resid uh, residual blend today, you've been test you've probably been offered a t uh, product which has got 0.2, 0.3% low sulfur uh, low sulfur VGO or whatever product it is. They're very very low sulfur contents. As we get closer to 2020, the demand of these products is going to pick up. The price of these products is going to pick up. Are they going to be as readily available? Is your refiner that you've been speaking to still going to have access to those streams in 2020? So again, you might have been testing a product today, but it might be a little bit different as we get closer to 2020. So what is uh, our forecast? So let's start with the distillate chart. So the distillates uh, column in 2020, you can see that means that 0.5% distillate-based fuel is going to be 40% of the market. 0.5% residual-based fuel is going to be 45% of the market. High sulfur, no, high sulfur fuel oil, no scrubbers, that's a polite way of saying non-compliance, around 5%. And high sulfur fuel oil scrubbers, around 6%. So initially, that demand for 0.5% fuel will be very, very great. But if you jump to 2025, the thirst for that product is going to dwindle a little bit. We get to 45% again, still for 0.5% sulfur. But that distillate 0.5% uh, blends, that drops to 28% as more people take on scrubbers. Now, if we just look at scrubbers in 2020, I'm aware of the time. Um, the Platts Analytics forecast is that, in two, that in, on the 1st of January 2020, there'll be 2,200 scrubbers in the market. By the end of January, this number will be 3,000. Now, that's a very small portion of the fleet, as we said, around kind of 6% of the fleet. As we get, as, as scrubbers become more attractive and the price is there, more people are going to want to install scrubbers. For example, I was telling um, some of the members of the audience last night that um, I was speaking to a ship owner the other day, and he said, I went to go and visit a scrub, some scrubber shipyards some um, scrubber companies in November, and I said, please can I have some scrubbers for my vessels? And four of them said no. No, supply, no surprise, the scrubber order book is full ahead of 2020. That's all what we've been told. 
Last, in March, he had those four scrubber uh, retrofitting companies knock on his door and say, I have a scrubber for you, I can install it this quarter. So there seems to be a little bit of a change in the wind about the idea of scrubbers. So maybe people have begun to back out of these, this, um, this scrubber kind of sphere. But there is a saturation point in the market. So our analytics team estimate that 6,000 scrubbers is the maximum that you can have in the market in order to make back your payment on your investment and also the price spread between uh, MGO and high sulfur or 0.5% fuel and high sulfur. Sorry. So what are Platt's doing to prepare for 2020? Sorry, I'll probably send you to sleep in this bit. But basically, we've been trying to prepare for 2020 for a while. So we've been speaking to the market for a long time about what specifications are out there and what assessments we need to reflect. As many of you are aware, we had launched uh, our 0.5% uh, uh, assessments for Fujairah, Singapore, Rotterdam and the US on the 2nd of January this year. Now, that specification that we are reflecting is ISO 8217 2010. The only thing that we have is 0.5% sulfur. I must have spoken to about 100 companies face to face and said, what specification should we reflect in our 0.5% sulfur assessments? And they said, the, all that you can do is 0.5% sulfur because we don't know. And yes, okay, some people are going to have a distillate grade, 0.5%, and yes, some people are going to have a 0.5% residual grade. But plats don't lead the market. We have to follow what the market is doing. So once we, there is more indications from the market, yes, we can look at, say, uh, looking at launching new assessments and stuff, but right now this is the information we have in the market. So let's look at this on a flat price basis. You can see that we have assessments for uh, Singapore, for Rotterdam, Fujara, as I mentioned, and uh, the US. So let's look at the light blue, light uh, grey line. So you can see that in the end of February, that price for that grey line dropped dramatically. Now, why is this? Why did this value drop so drastically? Because I was at the I was at a party in IP Week, and I got a message on my phone, and it said we've had the first trade in our 0.5% assessment process. So that was a 0.5% barge sold from Shell to Motiva, and it was delivered recently, and we've had another trade since. But that price spread was so much narrower, narrower than the indications we had been receiving from the market. That trade was around 20 to 30 dollars a metric ton above high sulfur fuel oil. Now. 0.5% fuel, it's going to be a product that is far more valuable than the 3.5% we know today. But as I said, it's nine months to go. This is a physical assessment today. There is limited demand in the market for this product. There is limited availability. And not many people have cleaned their uh, infrastructure in order to receive this 0.5% product. So that's why the price spread is narrower. And you can see on this chart that the 0.5% marine fuel in Rotterdam, which is the pink line, is pricing very, very close to that of a straight run value, a 0.5%, 0.7% straight run va value. And it's around uh, $50 a metric ton above high sulfur fuel oil. Now, there is no doubt that this price spread will increase as, I go for as we go forward. Now, ship owners have said to me, okay, if that's the price that you're reflecting in your MOC, I'm going to come in, I'm going to clean my tanks, I'm going to clean my, flush my lines, and I'm going to come and bid for this product and store it. And we know that there is a company in uh, offshore Malta that are building their inventories of 0.5%. But it takes time to clean this product. It takes time to clean your tanks. So whilst we are publishing these numbers, um, and people do think the price spread is narrow, it's because we're still nine months to go. As soon as we get to the second half of this year, there is no reason why the demand for um, this 0.5% product will pick up. And also, we can begin at looking, at looking to launch a Mediterranean assessment. So I know that a lot of the bunker industry in the Mediterranean prices off the FOB med cargoes or the SIF med cargoes, for example. The reason we can't launch a cargo assessment today is because that's 30 kT of fuel oil. Until, say, Repsol or somebody comes to me and says, I have 30 kT of product in my tank, and then somebody in Malta says, yes, I can receive 30 kT of product in my tanks, fine, we can look at launching an assessment. But is that infrastructure there today? Not yet. So this is the Singapore cargo window. I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but basically this is the market on close process. On the um, offer side, you've got Repsol and Mitsui, and on the bid side, you've got BP. So the Singapore market has been more active than the other regions of the world because you have the Chinese ECA of the 0.5%. You have the mini IMO in 2019. So China has got demand for cargo sizes of 0.5% fuel, and that's where we're seeing the real indications and the real kind of direction of the market. In terms of futures, so this is where the swaps come in. So we've got, we've had ICE who launched their futures contracts in February this year, um, and CME who launched theirs in December. And we've seen the first trades on the, on the spreads, and we've, we're still seeing 
trades today. So the, uh, the indications that you can see at the bottom left hand corner, those are trades. That's, that's the trade between of the premium of 0.5% fuel over 3.5% fuel, or the spread of the, the high five spread as the brokers seem to be calling it. And it's for a calendar 2020 contract. Now the first trade was done at $160 a metric ton. So they were saying that in calendar 2020, the premium of 0.5% fuel will be $160 over 3.5% over fuel. Now people said that was a little bit low. We're now seeing higher trades at like $188 a metric ton, and brokers are calling it, it's gonna be 200 soon. Now that we're seeing this liquidity in, the, in this assessment process, we can now look at launching a swaps assessment. Now I don't have an official date that we'll be launching it, but May this year is, the, is when we will be launching our swaps assessment. So you'll start to see a forward curve for 0.5% fuel being built and reflecting where the market is seeing value. And that can hopefully provide more clarity on where the price of 0.5% fuel will be in 2020 and beyond. And we're also launching a 0.1% DMA assessment for the ARA. Um, that may seem a little bit late to start launching an ECOFUEL um, based assessment, but um, this was the call of the market and we have to speak to different participants in the market and I'll speak to you more about that if you want to know that afterwards. But thank you very much and I'm aware I'm out of time. Thank you.